So welcome to this webinar and uh, thank you for attending uh, today. So we are very happy to get the interest of uh, a large number of people, of individuals, and not only across Europe, as we can see from different uh, countries uh, in, our, in our continent, but also uh, within the registration, we noticed that someone is also coming from Asia, from South America, so actually. So we are, we as a group of projects, uh, we are, uh, I, I must just start uh, saying that we are grateful to the team of uh, Horizon Booster Result, uh, which support us in tailoring uh, this webinar and other activities throughout uh, the last year. Um, the aim of this webinar is uh, basically focusing on uh, the topic that uh, cities and regions across the globe are being uh, pushed towards becoming greener and more sustainable. It becoming uh, clear that there is not uh, one fix at all uh, solution. And I'll talk the big challenges that every day we are facing, in particular those ones posed by climate change. Each city and localities has its own unique challenges, which need to be taken uh, into a specific uh, and particular account. The project group that actually we name it like Nature Based Solution for Urban Areas is composed from a, a series of different EU funded projects like Saturn, Landscape Metropolis, and Urban Renown. And uh, almost all of us are addressing uh, the topic of natural-based solutions. Um, and in particular, if they are uh, correctly implemented, uh, they can offer cost-effective and locally attuned answer to many of the environmental, social, and economic challenges that every day are facing uh, we like citizens and our uh, living places. In this webinar, we are going to listen to a series of different uh, witnessing from members of the project group uh, on their results that actually can be used for both local governments uh, and civil society um, organizations. So the first presentation is about an orchestra ecosystem project uh, co-founded by AT Climate Kick uh, that is called the System and Sustainable Approach to Virtuous Interaction of Urban and Rural Landscape, namely, and friendly, known like Saturn. The result of the project will be presented by Angelica Penegonda. Angelica Penegonda, is, she is a PhD candidate at the University of Trento. And moving from her participation in Saturn, she decided to create a, a startup called Ruma, of which she is the CEO. Uh, her company uh, recently has been awarded with a Going for Business Green Infrastructure Award by OISAL, the macro regional strategy for the European Union for the Alpine regions. So, uh, Angelica, the floor is yours. Uh, I remember that each of the panelists uh, will have uh, about 10 minutes to briefly present the, their uh, evidences from the project. And then uh, at the end of the webinar, we, can, we are going to have a question and answer session. Angelica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessandro. Okay. Is it everything okay? Do you see? Yes. Me? Okay. Yes, that works well. So, good morning, everyone. I'm Angelica Pianegonda, and I had the opportunity to work as a research fellow in the EIT Climate Kick Project Saturn. Sorry, I cannot. Okay. The starting point of the project has been the consideration that nowadays uh, the fragmented management of the landscapes and territories. Uh, leads to an incomplete climate strategies in which cities and natural landscapes are considered separately and independently. And this leads to suboptimal use and management of the resources involved. So the idea has been uh, to search for solutions to reconnect the landscape through the lesson of the past and having in mind the challenges of today and of the future. And the goal is, has been to build a framework that can help citizens to understand the landscape in which they live. Birmingham, Trentino and Gothenburg, Birmingham in the UK, Trentino in Italy and Gothenburg in Sweden, have been the three pilot areas in which the potential solutions have been tested. The three landscapes are very different from each other, as we can see in these photos. But this has been also a challenges, but also an opportunity to test similar solution in very different contexts. Birmingham City Council and Birmingham City University have been the two partners from the UK that have developed the visioning exercise tool. 
The visioning exercise investigates future potential scenarios or visions for a given territory and encourages us to think of a future and ask ourselves what can be done to reach the desired scenarios. The idea is to guide territories in a long-term vision and to think differently about the current issues and also in the ways of doing things. Uh, in the exercise, about one to 15 people are involved in each workshop, and the workshops are usually two of, alpha an, uh, sorry, of one hour and a half, about, and are organized to help the participants to see and define a bigger picture of their territories and understand the potential working in an integrated way. During the workshops, we use papers, maps, pencils, and posts to draw and picture future scenarios and actions for the given territories. The first task in the ex envisioning exercise is to break the ice with an individual drawing of a personal idea of a territory and the future of a territory. Then the challenge is to group people to put together the different scenarios and start to rethink the region, translating the dreams and aspiration into a map of working can, that can help to make real the vision that we investigated through the years and the decades. Finally, a group discussion helps to define the implication and the choices of the scenarios that have been uh, developed before. The three partners from the Trentino region case study have been the Fondazione Edmund Mack, the project leader of Saturn, the University of Trento, and the Fondazione Hub Innovazione Trentino. In Trentino, we uh, developed a tool that is called Rural Urban Metabolism. And the Rural Urban Metabolism is like a metaphor that compares the function of an organism, like humans, animals, or plants, to a territory. The Rural Urban Metabolism studies the flows of energy and material in the territories, with the aim to increase the sustainability of the territories itself, moving from a linear to circular metabolism. The analysis of a flow uh, can have an impact on spaces and is carried out to, put, to improve the circular economy of the territory. In the Rural Urban Metabolism 2 study, we have studied the ecological footprint of, uh, of our region, that is a measure of uh, the resources that are consumed in the region, and then the biocapacity, that is the capacity of the territory to recover the uh, amount of resources that are consumed. But, and then by comparing the ecological footprint with a bio, bio capacity, we can define if a territory is a bio capacity debtor or a bio capacity reserve of natural resources. Regarding the ecological footprint, so uh, simplifying the carbon footprint, we have calculated the carbon footprint of food waste and food consumption and also the carbon footprint of housing, like sewage, water, gas, electricity, and garbage. Then the, we have estimated the carbon footprint of services and goods, and the carbon footprint of private transport and public transport used in our region. After, we have calculated the biocapacity of the region, starting from the land use of the territory, and by multiplying the areas, uh, by some uh, parameters that are defined by the Global Footprint Network, we obtain the biocapacity of the region. And comparing the two, we, it emerged that the Trentino region is a biocapacity debtor. So, nevertheless, of a, a great amount uh, of uh, natural resources, as we can see in this next slide, uh, we consume more resources than we produce. After the uh, analysis of the carbon footprint and biocapacity, we studied the territory through a series of maps uh, to understand where it is possible to, uh, to uh, optimize the use of resources to create a more sustainable territory. And uh, at the end, we created a master plan to, uh, in which we defined the areas in which we can work to create a more sustainable territory. Uh, the last case study we, we investigated we, that was part of the Saturn project was the city of Gothenburg, in which we had three project partners, the city of Gothenburg, the I, and the region Vastra, Gotland. Uh, particularly interesting in the, uh, 
in the Gothenburg case study has been the development of a model farm that is a highly productive small farm unit that produce uh, food and also uh, develop some activity of education for the local uh, citizens. And uh, the main aim of a model farm is to showcase a business model that is sustainable and, su and successful to make uh, this model replicable in, uh, from other uh, local small farmers. The driver for, uh, of a model farm is a regenerative farming practices that are in continuous evolution from an urban and rural, for an urban and rural multifunctional landscapes. Some data about, about the model farm. Uh, now we are referring to the third season uh, of, uh, of the model farm. And uh, in the third season, we had like almost 40 different crops and more than 25,000 servings have been served in the local schools. So uh, in the model farm, a new urban farmer, Clara in this case, had produced these vegetables and uh, uh, sell them to the um, local uh, canteens. And she also tutored like about five, five part-time part -time interns. The model farm is, uh, has been a very great successful story. And uh, in Gothenburg, they developed a vision for 2025 in which the model farm will, will, is seen as an active and central hub for reconnecting the seasonal active satellite farms and spread the, uh, this kind of uh, activities through the municipality to recover some abandoned land, public abandoned land. Uh, the other goal is to make the model farm a, de a delivery of vegetables and uh, a point for the education of new urban farmers to spread the know-how, plant material, and also tools to the local satellite farms. And also the other satellite farms are linked to nearby school and also other public entities to deliver vegetable and uh, uh, educational learning. Another interesting tool developed in the Gothenburg uh, study has been the farming incubator that is a, a, like a hub of a, a, for an entrepreneurship training, especially agricultural entrepreneurship but create a strong partnership with the municipality, so between the small farms and municipality. Uh, the farming incubator acts by collecting, creating and testing successful business models, and they uh, organize training program, program through the winter season to, uh, to reach other farmers and uh, to start new uh, farmers opportunity in uh, the nearby of uh, Gothenburg cities. So thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you very much, Angelica. Also to be able to keep in the time. So actually it's perfectly within the 10 minutes uh, I've been assigned to you. <clears throat> now we're Italy, we move from uh, the Alps uh, to the plains of Pionor Padana in North Italy. <coughs> Pardon. To introduce uh, there, probably Landscape is um, a pathfinder and a demonstrator project co financed by IT Climate Kick. Lisa Sentimenti has been working uh, in, <coughs> in IS uh, since uh, 2004 as project manager. She designs and manages local, regional, national, and European projects uh, dealing with green transition. She will tell us more about the landscape metropolis journey, which implicitly is focused on mobility. Lisa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alessandro. Uh, I think Rob should launch the video first. Thanks.
So good morning, everyone, by my side. Let me just share my slides presentation. Okay, you should see them uh, uh, fine now. Yes. Okay, perfect. So good morning, everyone, again. Um, I think the short video we have just watched is uh, itself rather explicative of what Landscape Metropolis uh, territorial strategy is aiming to. Uh, indeed, technically uh, and strictly speaking, uh, Landscape Metropolis uh, has not implemented nature-based uh, solution measures, such as, for example, the ones uh, uh, that Juliet, uh, I, I think, uh, will, will, will show, will share with us, uh, such as, for example, uh, um, green roofs, uh, rain gardens, uh, or constructed wet wetlands. Um, nevertheless, uh, according to the NBS definition provided by the European Commission, um, I think landscape metropolis uh, can be considered itself uh, as a whole, uh, um, as a complex uh, and holistic systemic integrated uh, NBS. Why? Uh, because actually uh, landscape metropolis uh, as territorial strategies that is focused on the Ferrara area in Italy uh, can count uh, on a rich network of waterways uh, Nature 2000, uh, UNESCO, MAB sites, uh, uh, landscape metropolis, uh, I was saying definitely means uh, to make a good and clever use of green and blue infrastru infrastructures, uh, of course, offered by the landscape. Uh, and this uh, with the aim of uh, creating a sustainable and effective intermodal uh, mobility network, uh, made, of course, of uh, waterways, uh, cycle lanes, uh, railway lanes, uh, um, bus lanes, uh, and walking path uh, as uh, a declared alternative to the use of private high carbon vehicles for the daily mobility of citizens. And here I have used uh, the holistic and systemic uh, objectives, uh, uh, not by chance, uh, but because the implementation of such intermodal mobility network uh, uh, which is definitely deeply connected with the concerned landscape, uh, will have uh, uh, several spillover effects. Uh, and this we, will indeed trigger also according to the studies and the analysis we have carried out, uh, positive and climate, uh, um, climate and air quality impacts in terms, for example, of uh, CO2 emissions and uh, in terms of pol pollution reduction as well as also social and economic ones uh, through, for example, um, per urban, the inclusion of per urban fragile and inner areas now uh, physically connected to the city and by creating new jobs, uh, uh, thanks to the revitalized uh, fragile and inner areas uh, uh, with new economies now in place, uh, um, further effects will be less public spending for car accidents, uh, uh, which are a real trouble now for this area, as well as for uh, health disease due to air pollution um, issue. Unfortunately, today, within the allowed 10 minutes uh, time frame, I cannot deep dive and go into details, but further benefits in terms of regeneration, uh, deep renovation of buildings, uh, environmental monitoring uh, uh, and safety, social innovation, cultural and landscape heritage are also uh, envi envisaged as well, uh, explained, I think, by uh, the effective scheme you can see here displayed in this slide designed by one of our landscape metropolis partner. Uh, let's move to the journey uh, the, of the landscape metropolis territorial strategy. The concept uh, um, of the strategy was created in 2016 uh, 
uh, by local relevant uh, actors and stakeholders, but it was in uh, 2018 that we approached the EIT Climate Kick first with a Pathfinder project um, whose main objective was to come up with a business plan capable to provide figures for the real uh, implementation of the Landscape Metropoly Network. And it was within that project that we got the first idea uh, of the investment needed uh, for making the network real. Uh, also compare, as you can see here, um, to uh, really green and very impactful uh, um, infrastructures such as highways, along of course with demand analysis as well as a stakeholders impact analysis. 2019 was the year of the 24 month demonstrator project, always co-financed by EIT Climate Kick. Uh, we had very active uh, uh, partners, as you can see from the slide, and the, the main objectives were to launch experiments offered to citizens to test new ways for uh, effectively commuting uh, on a daily basis. Uh, second objective was to carry out deeply sustainable mobility campaigns um, targeted to schools and citizens. Uh, and third objective was to make available robust mobility data and decision making tools uh, for new territorial strategies and policies for local authorities, especially. The first uh, pilot project took place in October 2019. Uh, it connected the city center of Ferrara with a museum based uh, in a town of the pro province uh, by boats, uh, by, by bikes, and by e-buses. As shown uh, quickly uh, by the pictures and the local newspaper, it was uh, a great success, uh, especially in terms of uh, uh, participation and related generated impacts. Um, this, in the same year, mobility campaigns were also carried out through motivating apps and gamification tools created for citizens and schools, reaching also relevant results in terms of numbers and people reached schools, citizens, and in terms of impacts actually generated after those campaigns. 2000, uh, as you well know, uh, was the year of the pandemic, um, and, but not only uh, a second pilot experiment was implemented, but uh, a successful crowdfunding campaign, uh, citizen targeted, uh, was carried out, along with uh, the involvement of uh, um, the Po Basin Authority and other sponsors uh, financially supporting the building of a new peer um, in one of the concerned waterways. Also in this case, uh, despite the pandemic, and uh, I must say also, despite the bad weather forecast for those day of the experiment, uh, um, there was a great participation in terms of people, passengers joining the experiment, and also in terms of, uh, uh, again, uh, relevant generated impacts. In 2021, an effective uh, awareness, awareness campaign addressed to schools uh, was carried out in cooperation with uh, a, popular, a popular storyteller of the region that is uh, uh, Luigi Dalcin. Uh, the focus of the co-creation pathway with students uh, was on the landscape conceived as a, a common good and therefore many labs uh, were carried out. Uh, last but not least, in November 2021, Landscape Metropolis was selected as a case study presented in the session organized by Climate Heritage Network, Culture 21, in the framework of COP26 in Glasgow. Of course, uh, uh, we were very proud of such moment and we lived this event as a kind of uh, award uh, since we got that uh, um, the confirmation uh, by relevant actors and experts on sustainable development policies at international level about uh, the innovative and truly holistic nature of our territorial strategy. The Climate Kick project ended one year ago and 
in, in the meantime, but in the meantime, an association, Landscape Metropolis in Ferrara was born uh, with many local and regional actors with the aim of uh, pushing further the territorial strategy, either through an institutional uh, dialogue with regional decision makers and relevant stakeholders, or by searching for new uh, EU and national uh, funding for further implementation. Of course, AISA, our ener energy agency, is a member of this new association. And I wish uh, in very, in very uh, I'm, I'm, I'm closing uh, the, the presentation, but I wish uh, on this regard to take the opportunity of this webinar uh, for sharing that we are planning for next year to apply with a new project proposal in line with Landscape Metropolis uh, uh, vision and approach uh, to European calls such as LIFE or Interreg, uh, or any other suitable call. So if anyone uh, attending today the webinar can be interested to join such approach, such vision, please do not hesitate uh, to get in contact with me. Uh, thank you for your attention and sorry if I was too long, uh, Alessandro. Okay, thank you very much, uh, grazie Lisa. Uh, so actually we got a, so, so some appetizer of a potential networking uh, or maybe to go on with future exchanging activities with, with attendees and other projects here. So now we move from Italy to, to England to introduce the evidence from the project Urban Green Act, uh, a project supported by Horizon 2020. If Saturn and landscape metropolis uh, are operating in rural peri-urban territories or urban of small dimension, uh, now we are going uh, uh, in the case of on the case of Liverpool, which is entitled large metropolitan area with some traditional industrial or post-industrial future that is focusing on initiative carried out uh, in the inner urbanized area. So the speaker is uh, Dr. Judith Staples, who she has uh, 35 years uh, experiences in environmental projects, and is, she's currently leading and implementing nature-based solution at Liverpool City Council. Her speech is entitled Early Data Insight into Nature-Based Solution at Liverpool. Uh, Judith, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can I just check that you can see my screen? Yes, yes, you can see. Okay, right, thank you. Right, so yes, our project Urban Green Up is a Horizon 2020 funded project. Um, and in Liverpool, uh, we are working with the City Council where I work, the University and Mersey Forest. And the project as a whole has a number of uh, follower global cities and affiliated cities. And the focus of our work is to trial and monitor the retrofitting of a range of different nature-based solutions in the city in Liverpool, and we're monitoring environmental, social and economic benefits. So I'm going to start with the uh, tree sustainable urban drainage system. So this particular nature based solution consists of 20 trees that have been planted down the central reservation of a key city um, highway uh, in the main part of the city. And in the top left picture, you can see the soil filled trench in which the trees have been planted. And the black Lego type structures are uh, silver filled and they're there to provide support and structure and the trees are planted in the gaps between them. So the way this system works is the trees are planted here, this particular set in a run of eight separate trees. And when it rains really heavily and it's very wet, the water from the highway drains into the first of these trees and the water then runs along this soil filled trench uh, before it comes out at the end. And there, as I said, there are eight trees in that trench. What this does really is uh, as the water flows in the extra, extra water during heavy rainfall, as it flows into that soil field trench, the soil soaks up some of the water, the trees use some of the water to grow and for transpiration, uh, and that also slows the flow of water down through the soil. And that means that we delay the point at which that flood water potentially reaches rain. So when it also reaches the drain, there is less of it because it's been held within that soil field trench with the trees. And the soil has also filtered the water, so the water that comes out at the end is also much cleaner. So these trees help us to slow the flow, they reduce the final discharge to drain, and they improve the water quality. And in addition, provide added benefits as shade, cooling, and biodiversity. Our early data from the trees um, is still coming together. We are at very early stages of bringing this together. But the graph in the middle there, the blue line, uh, is the depth of water at the inflow of the first of the run of eight trees, and those peaks correspond to rainfall peaks. Uh, and the line underneath, the brownie orange line, uh, that is the depth of water at the last tree. So you can see that the trees are effectively attenuating some of those rainfall peaks. 
On the right hand side, I've got a picture of two test tubes, um, and these are water samples taken from the trees, the tree, and they are being analysed, but sadly we don't have the data just yet. The one on the left that is black and oily is from the first tree, and the one on the right that is lighter and, and brown is from the last tree. So we are expecting to see some significant information when the data is analysed. And we've also taken the opportunity at the bottom of the screen to in, um, retrofit a soil life sensor measures number of par parameters of the soil um, and we think that collectively this information will help us to have some really good evidence about how effective these trees can be in our cities for flooding. We've also on the subject of flooding because Liverpool has one of the fourth highest surface water flood risks in the UK we've installed the first city rain garden so this is able to take a volume each year of 420 meters cubed it's on a small urban street and we think under peak conditions of heavy rainfall that we can half the flow of water to drain by channeling it through this garden. The garden is in three parts, uh, mainly because there are utilities in between. Um, we've put different soils in each of the three sections and we're also testing plants that are tolerant of wet and dry conditions, plants that can actually help to clean the soil as well. And we have put a soil moisture sensor again in each of those beds. Our data is very early here. This has gone in fairly recently, but already looking at precipitation, we see different types of events. We have an intermittent event, which is sadly very typical of the British weather. So it rains, it stops, it rains again, it stops. And we find under these conditions that the uh, rain garden is able to fully, fully attenuate all the water. And then we have a deluge event, which is where we have very high precipitation in a short period. And here we see the rain garden um, working to capacity, and we're now beginning to look more closely at, at that element of the data. So we're able to look at things like velocity and flow to estimate the water flows through the system and our soil moisture sensors, the graph at the bottom, shows the different, how the different um, beds are performing. They all can comprise of um, compost with horticultural grit, different competitions, but we've added some recycled aggregate into one. And all this, again, all this data together at the end will help to inform us how the rain garden is working effectively. One of the other um, problems we've had in the city is blue-green algal blooms in some of our park lakes because they have very high nutrient levels. This island here is in a main park in the city. It's an old photograph, actually. Uh, the vegetation now covers that island completely and is taller than the person. Um, uh, and what we've done here is we put this island in because we think that the planting with the roots under the island in the water will help to soak up some of the extra nutrients and that may prevent the algal blooms. And then more recently, we've also added three leaky dams um, into a tributary to this park, which we know is high in nutrients as well. So our the early data is looking fairly promising, but again, it's not quite complete. Um, vegetation growth has been so good that we now need to clear some and remove some so that we can have continued growth next year. In terms of the invertebrate species, we have seen an increase, but they're still characteristic of quite poor conditions, but that's probably because we don't have enough good habitat nearby. We have a little bit of water data here. Um, after the island, we can see clear reduction in nitrates. We don't yet know about the impact of the leaky dams, but we're hoping that they will reduce phosphate and heavy metals. But the really positive thing is the second year now this island has been in place. And despite a really hot weather, uh, believe it or not, <laughs> um, in England this year, we didn't actually have al an algal bloom. And that's probably the first time in quite a few years. So we think that collectively these two systems are beginning to work. Green walls is something that we've looked at in the city as well. This is a soil based system in a really, really urban area. Uh, it's, it's been very well received and we're looking at a whole range of biodiversity, thermal, air quality, etc. We've also complemented that with another type of green wall. This, the top one there is a hydroponic wall with rainwater harvesting above a bus station and below we've got a uh, freestanding dual double aspect planted green wall where we're looking at air quality impact. But in general, looking at the early data from all the green walls, we think that we can see a local air quality improvement in the very fine particulate matters of 2.5 microns, the ones that often go into the lungs and stay in the lungs. Uh, we're seeing less um, any patterns really with the nitrogen dioxide. And that makes sense because we think the plants are trapping some of those fine particles. Uh, we also see good thermoregulation from the green walls um, and just as an illustration at the bottom I've put one of our thermal imaging slides on that shows you on a very, very warm day in England where the road was measuring 42 degrees C, uh, the area adjacent to the green wall was down to 25. So thermal imaging is something that we'll be uh, looking in more detail at. Biodiversity is also important. I don't have a lot of time to talk about this slide but um, we've got 
uh, the slides will go out and you can look at them. The axes aren't yet standardized. We've got um, plant diversity on the left and we've got pollinator diversity and abundance on the right for two sites. And we're getting different results. And we think this is because to get a fuller range of biodiversity and the, all the pollinators visiting, we need to also have stepping stones to allow them to get to the site. And the site at the bottom, which has got less biodiversity on the pollinators, is because basically there are no stepping stones, whereas the one at the top has, has kind of areas where animals and plants can move to. So we're going to be looking at that in a little bit more detail, but it's looking quite interesting. We're looking at also the walking and cycling associated with this. So although this takes into account a whole range of things like COVID behaviour, new cycle routes and other things happening in the city, we are seeing improvements in walking and cycling from data before and after the introduction of nature-based solutions. So we know that they are playing some kind of role in increasing active travel in the city. And then finally, I've got three slides here. Um, we are using a program, a modeling program, in addition to other work, which is called GIVAL or Green Infrastructure Valuation. The link is at the last slide. This allows us to um, ben, uh, quantify some of the benefits from all the work we've done. I've, I've shown you kind of three projects. We've got about 40 in total. Um, but if we look down the middle, we see carbon sequestered by trees, 155,000 kilograms of carbon, we estimate, which having a quick look the other day was about 34 cars, each doing about 11,500 miles per year. Um, likewise, there at the bottom, towards the bottom, over 6 million litres of water diverted from sewers. Um, and again, from all our projects, that figure, but that equates to something like about 16, 25 metres from pools. GIVAL also draws out some social aspects. It gives us an idea here potentially of up to 11 lives potentially saved per year from increased walking and cycling and reduced air pollution. And economically, it's able to put figures against things like reduced absenteeism, tourism, and full-time jobs created. And I've put the link there at the bottom, uh, so anyone that's interested can go and have a look at that tool. And that's one of the um, tools we'll be using, along with obviously the, the raw data uh, and other models, etc. when we present finally. Um, so thank you for listening. If anybody wants to find out any more, then very happy for you to contact me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juliet. Uh, absolutely fine uh, also in keeping the time. So it was really, really uh, helpful for, for, for the running and management of this, uh, of this uh, webinar. So it was really interesting to learn some practical example of the MBS in action uh, of what you did in, in Liverpool. And also, uh, personally, I think that it was really relevant to the, the value evaluation of the green and green and green infrastructure impact uh, you have done. It's actually it's really, it's really important also uh, for the strategies that has been carried out in different places of Europe. So actually, it was really interesting and promising. So um, uh, now we are open the last part. In the last 20 minutes, we have a Q&A session. Uh, we are operating on a, on a on a double level, so we I get some, some questions that we rise directly to the to the to the panelists. But uh, as Rob has written in the chat, uh, you can use the the question and answer tool of Zoom to, to write uh, any question, and then uh, actually we are, we are going to address the, the question to the to the panelists. I, I'm gonna start uh, first with uh, one question to to Juliet. So, Juliet, according to your experience, uh, how a city council like Liverpool could support the deployment of nature-based solutions, solutions into cities? There is a, a sort of a golden formula that should be followed. Um, I think it's uh, always very hard to start something new, uh, but I think if the city can lead by example, that has certainly helped us to spread the message. We've also taken the time to work with partners, developers, and community groups to gather that wider support. Um, I think you've seen some of our early data. Um, we hope to share that very widely at the end, both with our communities um, and residents and businesses, but also through our website at the end of our project, which will be in May uh, 2023. So we're very keen to, to share that information. Um, uh, I think also the goal, there isn't really a golden formula. I think. The Urban Green Up project has created a number of toolkits that can help people identify how to determine where to put a nature-based solution and what the best type might be. But I think the actual the formula really to getting anything um, to actually happen, apart from having funding, is community support and community buy-in. And I think that's where it's made a difference with us. I think that support has helped to push forward some of these innovative projects. Okay, so thank you very much. 
So roughly the point is, uh, as usual, uh, when you're operating with different uh, stakeholders, different sector to, to, to put uh, a serious investment in, uh, in, uh, in timing, in supporting them and getting them engaged and involved. So actually something that uh, has been uh, presented uh, during, during uh, her talk from, uh, from Lisa Sentimenti that actually is absolutely relevant to invest uh, in the engagement uh, and, and also because uh, it's important to get uh, financial resources I was I found really inspiring the idea to during the, the pandemic time to get this opportunity to get some uh, some opportunity to raise uh, crowdfunding money for for getting your your initiative. So, uh, Lisa, according to your experience, which is the suggestions or if there are methods or approaches that could be used to trigger the involvement not only of the interest bodies like could be the public authorities, but also by the citizens uh, to get to, to reaching the end of the project. Uh, thank you, Alessandro. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thinking about landscape metropoly and, and focusing on it, uh, uh, I must share that uh, cultural and behavioral factors in, in terms of uh, um, citizens' mindsets uh, has also been uh, uh, identified as a challenge in achieving uh, uh, sustainable mobility uh, for the concerned area and region. And given uh, and provided such assumption, therefore, I think the so-called toolbox uh, uh, made in our case, for example, of system innovation and design thinking contents and tools uh, uh, truly increase the capacity of engaging people, being citizens or um, key actors uh, you need to involve in your project or in your process. Uh, then uh, specifically uh, targeting uh, uh, people and citizens uh, in the case of uh, a landscape metropoly, in the sustainable mobility experiments we made, uh, I think they were also crucial uh, and rather effective uh, um, because in few words, uh, I'd say, let people make a good real life experiment and experiences such as simply getting an e-boat where you can also load your bike on uh, and then the awareness uh, around the more effective, sustainable and smarter way, ways for uh, simply daily community, commuting come up uh, early and immediately, I believe. Um, also the adoption of gamification tools uh, uh, such as the one we used uh, within Landscape Metropolis, uh, for example, Ferrara Play, Play and Go and Kids Go Green, um, I think made the use of sustainable means of transport uh, more pleasant and uh, concretely rewarding uh, since those apps uh, were used uh, with the further benefit in order to measure the effects uh, um, uh, achieved uh, and the impact generation generated by uh, the potential and future mobility system. Uh, with the other play, uh, app, uh, which was uh, Play and Go, uh, citizens could track their, their movements by bike, on foot, by bus, by boat, uh, by train, uh, and increasing the, the so-called green leaves uh, that were basically points uh, opening the door this way to uh, real prizes and uh, real awards uh, and, 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 and make them uh, uh, getting used to, to such uh, um, ways of commuting uh, on a daily basis. We focused also on education and training about the landscape, uh, consider again as a common good, um, targeting school through um, writing labs uh, carried out in a playful uh, way with the popular storyteller uh, Luigi Dalcin. And this was also very much appreciated and make, made the students, the pupils, uh, really engaged uh, in the process uh, of uh, awareness uh, uh, about uh, sustainable mobility and the importance of getting connected with the landscape also uh, on a mobility basis. Uh, finally, uh, I must say that especially, as you mentioned, during the pandemic year, we found the crowdfunding uh, uh, campaign very effective. Uh, 
um, in getting uh, citizens not only informed about the project, but also directly supporting uh, and showing they were keen uh, uh, on the places they live in. Uh, and for these reasons, they wanted and they showed to, to, to be eager uh, to take part uh, actively through their money uh, to the building of a new pier um, uh, for the concerned waterway. Uh, and the pier, I, I think, became this way a kind of symbol, not only in terms of physical, uh, uh, let's say, green infrastructure, but also from a social point of view uh, of a new uh, kind of merging process uh, uh, of a revitalized interconnection between the peri-urban areas and the city center. Uh, in conclusion and in short, uh, um, I think that in order to engage people, uh, you really need to pick the best uh, from your available toolbox. Sometimes tools and measures uh, to be applied and put in place uh, are pretty ordinary, but sometimes uh, you really need uh, also to uh, add further ingredients, uh, uh, such as a bit of uh, creativity, uh, and out of the box uh, thinking to find them out uh, and in order to be really uh, effective. That, that's all. Thank, thank you, Lisa. So actually, um, so the drivers on the cultural and behavioral uh, aspects uh, actually uh, could be absolutely relevant. As, as we can see also, it's not only by the, having something uh, I mean, in concrete, like uh, having this uh, infrastructure in the US that has been reported, it really could be attractive to uh, let people more engaged in um, moving uh, to get a certain level of DT, but also to really get this kind of idea of engagement also through different uh, activities. So, but uh, there could be also some points uh, that actually could be also coming aside from, from the actions that we were going. So in particular, in the question and answer uh, tools of Zoom, uh, we have a, a, a couple of questions that uh, should be Address it directly to Juliet. In particular, we can say maybe the the the, the by side effect of, of uh, um, on green infrastructure because, for example, an NBS. So I can read the question from Kate Morley. So have there been any green gentrification effects in the study areas, which have had any negative effects on more marginalized communities? So I guess that would be. In particular, knowing the experience of uh, Saturn and landscape metropolis, something that actually could be more relevant to Judith. So actually, I guess that if and Judith can give you a quick answer to this question, then we are going to the next one. Hello, thank, thank you for the question. Um, we haven't got all our social and economic data through yet, but basically the interventions in Liverpool are very small and very local. So the opportunity for that kind of gentrification um, is probably quite low. We've not done things on a very large scale that have affected large areas. The idea is to tackle local problems um, in, in a local and direct way. I, I would be surprised if when we get our data back we see an, anything particular. I think the COVID, the pandemic, the, the drop in house prices, all these sorts of indicators that we're looking at, I think because of other world events, we're probably unlikely to pick up any kind of increases in those kind of indicators. But yeah, we're not we're not fully through the data at the moment. Thank you, thank you, Judith. Uh, there is a, a question from Juan Juano uh, about what the commitment those urban green up expect from cities authorities that has, that have chosen to be part of the network of cities. This question actually is directed as to green up, but I guess that the point how how the cities authorities, the public authorities, could be involved is uh, is common for for all the others. But actually, maybe. Juliet, you can share your direct experience with this, the city of Liverpool. I couldn't quite hear that. Was it about how the public and was it tourists have been involved? Was that the question? I couldn't hear. So what, what are the commitments that, that uh, the city okay. authorities that decide to be part of the network should be uh, should be oh. taken in the, in the medium and long term? OK, I think in, in in understanding the question, I think you're asking about the, the other cities. So we've got um, some partner cities who are see follower cities who are looking to replicate some of the work we've done and to learn from the mistakes. You know, we've got things wrong. That's all part of innovation and challenge. Uh, and then we have a number of affiliated cities who have access, I understand it, to our website and uh, to some of the deliverables and are invited to lots of the uh, kind of uh, information sharing webinars as well. And then, of course, at the top, Liverpool is one of three front-runner cities on this project. 
So we have Valladolid in Spain and Ishmir in Turkey, both of whom are implementing very similar types of nature-based solutions, but on different levels. So for example, in Ishmir, the question about gentrification, Ishmir have done an amazing project on the Perigou stream where they have put in cycleways, walkways, pollinators, planting, thousands and thousands of trees and really, really turned over and improved a massive area. So it may well be that they would pick up some kind of gentrification. But in Liverpool, as I said, it's a different approach. It's small interventions at local locations. And Spain has done a little bit of both. It has some larger projects and some smaller ones. So yeah, there, there are kind of three areas of cities joining us, that the partner cities, the follower cities who are copying and replicating, and then the affiliated cities who have joined and signed up to learning from Urban Greener. Thank you, Juliet. So in fact, the point of collaboration and cooperation absolutely are crucial in deploying uh, real results from, from the, the activities we are carried out moving from the research and innovation center. So uh, also this is, this, uh, these two words are uh, crucial and pivotal also for the subtle project that uh, as reported, uh, um, the collaboration from different sectors, academia, public authorities and NGOs towards a unique goal. Um, but the point is, as maybe has been uh, shortly uh, been, uh, presented during the presentation by Angelica, if there is the space for creating business opportunities, either in strict relation to the nature based solution or, or um, blue and green infrastructures. So Angelica, can you tell us something from your direct experience of what you learned from, from working within Saturn? Yes, for sure. I think that uh exist some uh, opportunities, some business opportunities, and uh, also connection between public and the private uh, uh, bodies. Because as we can, we saw in the Gothenburg case study, the municipality has been a, and is a key player in the agroecosystem business network of the region. Because uh, in the last years, the municipality um, give the opportunity to some local citizens to rent some small uh, piece of land and also to attend some courses to, to learn how to manage a farmer and how to manage a, a business. So now we have uh, uh, a lot of new farms that are um, producing vegetables that are sell in Gothenburg for, with, uh, for example, the Rico uh, project, but also with a uh, uh, direct uh, sell in uh, groceries uh, and uh, for example, CSA organization. And uh, I think uh, that also Saturn and in particular Gothenburg has been an opportunity to spread this good practice in other regions. For example, here in Trentino, because a uh, 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 little uh, uh, local municipality, uh, the municipality of Arco here uh, close to Trento, started a new project uh, inspired by the Gothenburg case study. And uh, currently about 50 uh, young citizens are participating and attending uh, the project uh, that is called Giovani Coltiviamo il Futuro. And um, uh, they are uh, uh, attending some lessons to learn the basis of the agroforestry practices. And uh, uh, in the next year, is planned that the municipality of Arco will uh, give them uh, some small areas, one or more than one small uh, abandoned public uh, areas to uh, start a new opportun business opportunity and also to start a new farms in the, in, uh, the, inside the territory of the municipality of Arco. And uh, one of the main uh, uh, characteristic that will have this, uh, um, this farm is that we, it, it will have to be very, very sustainable. So we are growing a new kind of green network of uh, small uh, agricultural, sustainable agricultural farms in Trentino that can help to improve the green infrastructure of the region. Yeah, but I want to say not only on direct on the produce side, but also on the service side, because also you are the CEO of a startup that actually is, is providing services. And um, you, are, you are one of the, the results from the project Satur, but uh, you are the, not unique because uh, as some of us work in uh, in the IP climate community, we have been uh, we have been we have, we have seen the opportunity to have a lot, maybe not a lot, but actually a good number of new new companies that have been created. So actually, maybe with some challenges uh, that are rising. So maybe maybe if you want, just have a, in one minute say something about Ruma, 
would be really appreciated maybe also for, for the attendees for inspiration. Yes, Buma born, uh, as you see, as you say, uh, with a um, Saturn project, because at the end of the Saturn project, we attended a, a, a program to uh, transform research into businesses. And we started our path. And uh, then we also uh, have the opportunity to be part of a Green Infrastructure Goals Business Award. That is an initiative from the EU OZAL. And now we are uh, working to create a platform, an online platform, that uh, um, will provide some services to monitor and evaluate the regenerative project of the territory, ecological regenerative project of the territory. So through in satellite images and also with the use of sensors, uh, we will be able to monitor, for example, a reforestation project to understand the carbon, uh, the carbon that is stored inside the plants and also the the role that this kind of project uh, have inside the territory to improve uh, the biodiversity and also some other ecological uh, ecosystem services. Thank you, thank you very much, Angelica. Just give us a very, very, very short, uh, less than one pitch elevator uh, presentation of Ruma. Uh, so um, we also say, uh, I can also say that also part of your. Uh, History in creating this startup is also connected with the, the support of Horizon Blue Clusters, uh, on which we have been supported uh, within 2020-21 to support uh, the creation and integration of these business uh, opportunities. It was one of the, the opportunities that actually has been granted uh, through these services, as, I mean, uh, given to, to most of the European projects by the Commission. So actually. Uh, as we started uh, saying thanks to Horizon Root Boost Booster activities, we say also again yes to, to them at the end of this webinar. I'm also grateful to, to Juliet uh, from um, re reporting us from the case of Liverpool, Lisa from, uh, from uh, Metropolis, the Palazzo Landscape Metropolis, and Angelica from Saturn for giving this uh, short presentation. And also, before to go, uh, as uh, Rob uh, reminded me, uh, because because actually we are more or less uh, in the eve of the Christmas uh, time, uh, I will just remind you that uh, for all the attendees of the today webinar or those one registered, uh, you you will receive uh, a gift from us uh, that actually will be reporting some of the evidences from our project and maybe some uh, to create new opportunities for. Uh, tackling our next to be future challenges. So thank you very much from our side and from us with panelists and enjoy your uh, ending of the working season uh, this year and uh, enjoy your uh, Christmas time uh, in front of you. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye everyone, thank you. Thank you all, bye. Thank you, bye.